Hello, um, I'm Carlos Hoyos. I'm one of the psychiatrists in Lee House, and I'm here to talk to you about one of the holy cows of psychiatry, which is formulation. So, two things to know about formulation. Uh, one, it's a story, and second, it's a story that helps you make sense of behavior. Those are the two things I'm going to repeat over and over, and, and that's what you need to remember about formulation. A story that helps you make sense of behavior. Yes. So if you want to know a little bit more about it, the six things to remember. So it is a narrative. So it's a story. It has a narrative form. It has a beginning, a middle and an end. And it separates what is the story, the narrative from the context in which it, ha it happens. The difference between text and subtext. The second idea is that it is an analytical account. You you are making distinctions between things and connections between things. It's not just a classification or a presentation of a fact. The third thing is that it's always an opinion. A formulation is subjective and different people have different formulations. The th fourth thing is that a formulation makes causal attributions. It explains why things happen or tries to explain why things happen. It makes attributions of causality. The fifth thing is that it is an ideographic construct. It's specific to each case. You're not trying to define what everybody with the same problem does, but what happens in that particular case. And the last bit is that formulations are always fluid. They keep changing all the time. That's the nature of formulations. So if you only want to know the basic about formulations, you've had it. Those six things, a story that makes sense of things, which is a narrative, is analytical. It's an opinion, makes causal attributions, it's ideographic and fluid. You can stop here if you want to. But if you want to know a little bit more about the two key things, so how we make sense of behavior and what type of story a formulation is, stay on and I'll explain those. So the next thing I want to talk a little bit about is how do we make sense of behavior? And um, so we all do that, but what do, what do we mean making sense of behavior? Before I start talking about that, I need to uh, tackle a couple of very difficult concepts. And the first one is this thing called the mind. Yes. So the mind is it, it drives people crazy when we talk about it, especially doctors who uh, have trained in biology and find it difficult to get their heads around this thing called the mind. So let me spend just a little bit of time uh, talking about the mind. So the first thing is the mind is defined for what it does. So the mind is a psychological idea, is a construct, and it's defined by what the mind does for you. So the mind is a collection of functions, psychological functions, um, that uh, your nervous system does for you. So for instance, your nervous system, the nervous system of most living organisms has a function, which is that it allows organisms to move in order to look for food and to nourish themselves. Um, um, very simple minds from worms, they still have that function, they can do that. And as organisms evolve, new functions arrive, so some of them are able to remember where food is and they have memory, they're, they're their nervous systems are able to store information and then have a representation of what reality is like in, in inside of the mind. So the mind's functions are to know what is up and what is down and what is right and what is left and what's there and what's not there. And also orient orient yourself in space and in time to have a memory of what came first and what came second. And then you have functions that have evolved later only to certain animals, which are kind of functions that allow certain animals to um, to live in societies, like being able to identify threats or being able to know who's going to help you or being able to c c drive sexual behaviors so or knowing who you can mate with and who you can't <laughs> and also um, establish connections and relationships that allow things like, for instance, bringing up babies, you know, uh, and also sense more complex social functions, so the ability to recognize a group and who is us and who is them. Um, and then one last function, there's many more, I'm just mentioning some, but one last function that is worth mentioning is that uh, in very advanced um, uh, organisms, uh, the, there is a function of the mind that allows us to understand that other organisms also have minds of their own. We call that theory of mind. Yes. 
So when when I talk about the mind to uh, people who are trained in medicine, uh, they usually refer to the mind or the brain indistinctively. You know, so oh, my brain uh, has memory, or you know, and and it's important to spend some time differentiating the, the two. And in order to differentiate between the two, it's helpful to start with uh, a simple uh, function of the brain or the organisms. So all organisms have an eye. Yes, uh, well, you have the eye and you have all the um, mechanisms or all the circuitry behind the eye that allows the eye to produce vision. Yes, so you have the eye and you have what the eye produces, which is vision. Yes, so vision, the ability to understand colors and understand shades and perspective and all those things. Yes, so when we talk about the eye, we talk about a biological concept. But when we talk about vision, we talk about a seri series of constructs that we've invented in order to describe what the eye does, like color. Yes, so there is no such thing as color in biology. What there is is a perception, a psychological experience of colour. So we talk about the eye and we talk about vision. And it's helpful once you make that distinction that vision is what the eye produces to understand that the mind is what the brain produces. So when we talk about the brain, we're talking biology. When we're talking about the mind, we're talking psychology. Just like the eye produces vision, the brain produces the mind. Yes? Only this is slightly more complicated um, because uh, it's not just the brain, is it? Uh, so it is the brain and the brain stem and then all the organs that produce um, hormones that affect the brain, like uh, androgens and estrogens and adrenaline. That, that, that's crucial in, in creating a mind. Yes. And the second complication is that the mind is not just a series of mental constructs. The, the mind produces behavior so and behavior is something observable something that happens outside of the organism so so the brain is the nervous system and the mind is something that explains behavior in fact the way to analyze this is not uh, like the eye and vision the way to explain this is that the mind is what we invent in order to explain behavior as a function of the nervous system. And that's the explanation of what the mind is that I'm happy with. So when we observe somebody's behavior, so uh, we, we can watch two people interacting and we observe them. We, we, when we observe them, we interpret, we make sense of their behavior using our theor theory of mind. So we assume that there is a mind inside the person we are observing. And we try to understand what's going on in that mind. So, for instance, we might say what is happening in the mind of this guy is that he is uh, flirting with that girl because he likes her. And he is uh, mm, uh, very happy about it. Uh, and he's getting feedback. And he's excited because uh, it, he thinks things are going well. All those are attributions that our mind does to the mind of that other person in order to explain the behavior they're doing. And in order to explain that, we use a lot of functions of the mind. Yes, uh, we attribute uh, causality, we attribute intentions, we uh, attribute emotional states and anticipation, lots of things that we experience by ourselves, we attribute to the mind of this other person. And what I'm going to try to explain a little bit more is how we do that process, how we do use our minds to understand the minds of other people and, and how, to, how we understand the minds through their behavior. So uh, how do we make sense of people? So making sense of the behavior of people is one of the most important things that uh, anybody does. And in psychiatry, that is our job constructing formulations, narratives that explains people's behavior. And there are different ways to go about it. And I'm going to explain five of those. And I'm going to use an example. The example is this. Um, uh, in my house, uh, there are huge spiders. And when my wife sees the spiders, she freaks out. She freaks out and she runs out of the room. Yes, um, That's a very strange behavior. Yes, uh, These are tiny spiders. Yeah. 
Um, so I need to explain this behavior and I can go about several ways to explain the, this behavior. And the obvious first way to explain this behavior I'm a psychiatrist would be to say, well, there's something wrong with her. This is not right. So let's take her to see a psychiatrist. Yes. So if I take my wife to see a psychiatrist, um, the psychiatrist would try to make sense of her um, uh, of, of what's going on in her mind. Yes. Um, and the and the psychiatrist um, would uh, make an appointment, um, and uh, she would uh, and the psychiatrist would expect my wife to give a history. And my wife would say something like, when I see a spider, uh, my heart starts to mm, go very fast and I feel like an like a overwhelming wave of emotion and I believe uh, the spider is going to kill me and I have to run away. Yes. And the psychiatrist, uh, because he's a, a doctor, he knows uh, the diagnosis and, and those characteristics fit the diagnosis of a phobia and will give a diagnosis which is a phobia and will say you have a phobia and this explains your behavior your behavior can be explained in terms of mental health of a diagnosis of mental health what the psychiatrist has done is he's used something called the biological model which is predicated on the idea that behavior is a symptom of a biological condition Yes. Uh, and that the underlying problem is a biological condition that produces that behavior. Yes. And this is how doctors think about everything. And that's how psychiatrists think about behavior. So behavior is a symptom of a con underlying condition. And you explain uh, these abnormal behaviors by diagnosing a condition. Uh, a biologically based condition. In this case, a phobia, which is an anxiety disorder, which we know is to do with 5-HT receptors and runs in families, and um, and it's a type of anxiety. And mm, uh, and that would be confirmed because my wife does have some anxiety and her mother does have anxiety, so that makes sense. So that's an explanation. Okay. What happens is then uh, the treatment for a phobia is um, something called uh, progressive desensitization, which is done by psychologists. So my wife would then go to a psychologist and would explain her problem, which is that when she sees a spider, her heart goes very fast and she gets, has an overwhelming anxiety, wave of anxiety, that because she thinks she's going to die and she has to run away. Now, the behavioral psychologist that does progressive desensitization will explain this in his own terms, which would be there is a stimulus, a spider, that causes her to run. Um, and after she runs, she calms down. She's happy again. And the problem here is that she needs to stop running away and being able to be with a spider and not be anxious. Psychology has a set of... Uh, 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 um, scientific knowledge like uh, the uh, um, the anxiety curve which we know that every type of anxiety uh, peaks and then reduces even in the presence of the same stimulus and uh, and the psychologists would um, uh, find ways to understand this behavior uh, usually uh, based on what they know about learning theory which is that if you have a behavior such as running away when you see a spider that gets rewarded then it gets learned. You do it more because that behavior is rewarded. And running away when you see a spider is rewarded because it does reduce the anxiety. Whilst if you stay with the anxiety uh, with the spider, you're, you're, you, you become very anxious and very unwell. So that, that actually punishes you for staying. And the way to fix this problem is to reverse those and to find a way to reward staying with the spider, um, find ways to stop her running away. So she learns that it is possible to stay with the spider and not be anxious. And that's the basis of progressive desensitization. Now what's happening here is the psychologist is not understanding what's happened as a biological condition. He's understanding what's happened in terms of behavior itself because he's using a behavioral model that says that behavior is it in its own right. It doesn't depend on biology. It depends on learning theory. So if you understand how people learn, and um, then you understand um, why people do what they do. You don't need to explain behavior in terms of biology. You stem explain behavior in terms of learning. And uh, that is psychology, the psychology of learning. So psychology explains behavior, not biology. And this is what's normally called the 
pilot the behavioral model. And the behavioral model has been very important and it's a purely scientific model based on observation. And um, it, it was very popular in the 50s and the 60s. And a lot of research that was done then with pigeons, rewarding and punishing pigeons, led to algorithms on what kind of rewards work, which underpin uh, things like slot machines or Facebook algorithms. So it is very important. So we have now two models, really. One is the pathophysiological model or the biological model, which says behavior is a symptom of a condition and uh, biology is the cause of behavior. And another, and of course doctors know best, and, and another one which says, uh, no, behavior is something in itself that needs to be studied in itself and is explained by learning theory and psychology explains behavior. Yes. Um, uh, these are two different ways to look at the same behavior. I'm not saying one is right and one is wrong. These are two different ways to look at the behavior. Yes. Um, so um, so mm, the behavioral model works very well for phobias. Um, so most people who have phobias of spiders and go through progressive desensitization are able to get rid of it. And I have treated people with phobias. And uh, when I worked as a junior doctor, we had um, a deal with uh, um, London Zoo to borrow spiders for this sole purpose. So very successful for phobias. And then the behavioral psychologists turned their attention to another big condition, which is depression. Yes, And behaviorists developed theories of depression based on behavior. And the psychologists developed theories uh, to explain depression in behavioral terms um, uh, and uh, uh, developed therapies for uh, depression in terms of, you know, training people to respond and, um, and, and get away from their model which was learn helplessness so they had learned to be helpless about how they felt and that didn't work at all until psychologists working in this area thought well hold on things are much more complicated than observable behavior because behavior is also underpinned by other things yes and that's when psychologists became interested in what people thought and how people felt and what they said about it so if my wife with her phobia goes to a uh, different type of psychologist and says i have uh, you know when i see a spider my heart races i get an overwhelming wave of emotion i think i'm going to die and i run away there is a type of psychologist who will think hold on what is going here with this behavior of running away what is she thinking and how is she feeling because the understanding of this type of psychologist is that, yes, she she needs to be happy with a spider. But the problem here is that she thinks she's going to die. And if we change that thought, if she if we somehow manage to change what she believes, then the behavior will change. So the key is not what she's learned, it's what she's thinking. Yes, And this type of psychology is called cognitive psychology. Uh, is predicated on the idea that behavior is not just about learning. It depends on thoughts and feelings, and the three of them interact. That's the cognitive triangle. This is the basis for the cognitive psychological cognitive model that, that purports that behavior follows thoughts and feelings, not just learning. Yes? And in order to understand behavior, you need to understand thought patterns. And in order to change it, you need to change thought patterns. And that is the interaction between behavior, thoughts and feelings that is the key to what people, why people do what they do. So as you can see now, we have three models. So we have the model, the, the biological model, we have the, the, the behavioral model and the cognitive model. Okay. So now let me tell you about another story, not just the one of, of my wife, but uh, uh, many years ago when I was um, uh, working uh, as a junior doctor, I got referred a little boy uh, who had a phobia. Uh, whenever he went to school, he uh, ran away and there was no way of stopping him. And the teachers who are usually pretty good at behavioral models had tried desensitization and that hadn't worked at all. So he was referred to me, says, well, there must be something he's thinking that is affecting why he's doing that. Either that or he has a biological condition that is making him that. So either give him medication or um, treat his thoughts. Yes. So this was a seven year old boy. I wasn't going to give him medication. So I sat down with him and I tried to understand what he was thinking. 
and I spent 40 minutes asking him what he was thinking. And I don't know if you've tried this with seven year olds, but it's very difficult to get any answer other than I don't know. So after uh, quite a lot of time, I asked him to draw something for me. And I said, please, can you do a drawing? Do you like drawing? Yes, I do. Uh, can you do a drawing of you going to school and see if I can get something? So he um, sat down and very carefully drew a very big, tall building with lots of windows. He spent ages doing the windows and drew his mom in one of the windows. And then he drew his school and then he drew himself. And after he'd drawn himself going to school, he drew this big figure. Um, uh, which was, you know, quite big and uh, uh, detailed and had a big uh, thing in his hand. And I said to this boy, what, what, what is that? And uh, who, who, who is that? And say, oh, that, that's my daddy. I said, all right, so wh where is your daddy? No, no, my daddy is in prison. I said, all right. Um, so he doesn't take you to school? No. I said, so, so, so why did you draw him? Um, he might take me to school when he comes out. And I said, well, is he coming out? I don't know. And I said, oh, what's that thing your dad is holding? Yeah, uh, well, my dad, my dad has got a very big machete. And I said, all right, your dad's got a machete. That looks a bit scary. Uh, is that scary? No, it's not very scary, no. Yeah. So I wonder, those of you who are listening, whether you want to take some time to work out whether you think is scary and whether you think he is scared and he's just not telling you, or he doesn't even know how scared he is. Because what you see here is something quite extraordinary. It's a boy that, that spends a lot of time drawing uh, something about his dad in a threatening position. And that makes me think that even though he tells me, and he might think he's not scared, I think he is scared. And that explains his behavior. Yes? What's happened here, though, is that I am presuming what's going on in his mind. I'm not hearing what he's saying. I'm not observing what he's doing. I am guessing that I know what's going on in his mind better than he does. Yes? And that's not cognitive psychology and it's not behavioral psychology. It's a different type of psychology altogether. It's a model predicated on the idea that people's minds are uh, submerged be below what people are aware of. I, if you wonder, is an unconscious part of your mind and you only understand a tiny bit and that with care people can see what's underneath your mind because there is an unconscious mind that drives behavior not your conscious not the bit of your mind that you know but the bit you don't know that's called the psychodynamic model and uh, it, it presumes that behavior is driven by unconscious processes and that those unconscious processes are accessible through interpretation and subjective interpretation. And it doesn't mean that what you think is right, but that what it means, because there might be another explanation, but that the explanation can be uh, got to by interpreting as opposed to sticking to what they say. And so we, what we have here is yet another psychology. So we now have three psychologies, which is the behavioral psychology that says um, we study observable behavior and we're based on learning theory, rewards and punishments. And then a more complex psychology that says no, behavior is dependent on feelings and is dependent on beliefs and things like automatic thoughts drive behavior. And then there's the other psychology that says, no, it's the unconscious that drives behavior and it's irrational and it's subjective and you cannot scientifically study it. You have to interpret things. Now, the first two psychologies is what people call cognitive behavioral therapy, cognitive behavioral psychology, CBT. And the third one is what people call a psychotherapy or psychoanalytic psychotherapy. So it's uh, is is not quite the psychology studied in um, in universities. So that means you have three psychologists plus the biological model. So we now have four models, which is the biological one, the behavioral one, the cognitive one, and the um, um, psychodynamic one. And I want to spend some time uh, talking about a fifth one. <laughs> Sorry, there is a fifth. Uh, model that we use all the time, which is the model predicated on the idea that it's not that one thing causes another, it's how things go together that causes something more complicated, like a watch. So it's not that there is a bit of the watch that tells the time, it's that the way the little bits of the watch are are put together 
that does something that none of the pieces do, which is to tell the time. And if you want to understand behavior, you need to understand what the behavior means to the people around the person who behaves. So the idea is if you want to understand what's going on in, in somebody's mind, you need to understand what's going on in the minds of the people around them. And not just what's going on in each of their minds, but how those minds connect to each other, how they make meaning together. Yes. So uh, and and the focus is not of, on what's going on inside the minds, but is more on the connections between people and what goes on between minds. So patterns of relationships, the context in which those minds operate and the co-construction of meaning between those people and, and 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 the context for that is not just the people in the family but a much wider context so what's going on politically what is going on in terms of the way society ascribes privileges and values yes and i'll give you an example if my wife with her spider phobia goes to a family therapist and the family therapist says, well, I will treat you for your phobia, but I need the whole family to come to understand what's going on. And uh, so because I love my wife, I would go to the family therapy with my wife and the family therapist would say, well, what happens when you run away when you see a spider? What does everybody else do? And uh, I would say, well, what happens is I roll my newspaper and I go and I smash the, the spider and then everything is fine. And, um, and then the therapist would say, how do you feel about that? Said, I'm very cool about that. And then the therapist might find that one of my daughters is laughing a little bit and say, well, why are you laughing? And says, oh, because that loves killing spiders. And my other daughter laughs and my wife smiles and says, oh, tell me more about this, you know. And then they say, well, it turns out that he doesn't do many manly things around the house. He scrap at DIY, all the things men are expected to do. But the only thing he's good at is smashing spiders. So whenever there's a spider, by the, he's very happy about it and the therapist would say, is that right? Say, well, it's not that I'm happy about it, but, you know, I don't mind doing this for my wife. Yes. So the families might, the family therapist might construct a meaning to that behavior, which goes beyond what's going on in my wife's mind and what's going on around it and what the behavior means to everybody, not just to my wife. And then the family therapy might end up saying, well, actually, why don't you just ignore the phobia and uh, keep it up because uh, that's what keeping your mm, your family together. And if you get rid of the spider phobia, who knows, you might get a divorce. So go on and stay with it. Yes, I'm not saying that's what happens, <laughs> but it's an example of a different way of understanding the same behavior. So the idea that there are other models than the psychological and biological models, and this is called the systemic model. So the systemic model is predicated on the idea that behavior is a product of context. And that if you want to understand behavior, you need to understand the different narratives that explain behavior, not just the one. And, th and you need to understand that behavior is not always caused by a direct line, but that often behavior is circular. So because one person influences uh, A, then A influences B. So uh, you, d you don't listen to me. Um, um, so I have to nag you. And the other person would say, no, sorry, you nag at me all the time. That's why I'm not listening to you. So the idea that causality in, in behavior is circular. Um, so those are key ideas about the systemic model that calls for another video. Uh, at the moment, I just want to, st I'll, I'll stop here. The idea that there is five models to understand, the four that I've been going on about, the three psychologists plus the biological one, plus the systemic model. Okay, so when we, see somebody's behavior and um, and uh, we need to explain it. Uh, what doctors do is they explain things with a diagnosis. They'll say, this is a phobia. ICD-10 says that. But there is a more rich way of explaining the behavior, which is to construct a story, a narrative that says something like, well, the problem here is you see a spider and you run away. And that's because you had a friend who um, uh, in Australia died um, when they were bitten by a spider. And that makes you believe that you're going to die. And of course, that is maintained because the relationships in your family mean that uh, it's much easier for your husband to smash the spider than, than to deal with this or even try to understand what's happening. Uh, and because the family is happy otherwise, and because you have a predisposition to anxiety, um, uh, th that explains what happened. And actually, you might want to take a, a bit of medication for anxiety or you want to have 
other options. Yes, that's a much richer way of understanding what's going on, other than saying this is a phobia. Yes, and that's the difference between a formulation and a diagnosis. Yes, so a formulation is a story that uh, makes sense of behavior. So I've explained how we make sense. Now I'm going to spend a little bit of time telling what kind of story a formulation is. So a formulation is a story uh, that follows a particular pattern. And the pattern is that we first decide what the problem is. And once we've decided what the problem is, we decide what makes this person vulnerable to that behavior in the first place. Yes? So um, why uh, this person could possibly have had this from the beginning. And then we separate that from precipitant uh, um, factors. What triggers that problem at that time when they present to you? And once we've done that, we said this is the problem, this is what predisposes to the problem, this is what precipitates it, then we look at what makes the problem worse as it is now and what makes the problem better as it is now. And that's the structure of the narrative of a formulation. That's a convention. This is what we, how we agree to construct stories. And we call those five uh, aspects, five P's, because we can have words that explain them. And they all start with P, which is the problem, the predisposing factors, the precipitating factors, the perpetuating factors, and the, prote and the protective factors. We're talking about factors as bits of information. And factors themselves don't Imp don't, they imply but don't explain causality. The causality is, is, is explained through the models. So we might say the problem here is that you have a phobia. Or we might say the problem here is that when you see a spider you run away. And then we might say this is precipitated by you move into an old house or this is precipitated by your husband uh, being crap at DIY. And you're pre predisposed to this through a biological thing, which is you have a genetic predisposition to anxiety, or you're predisposed to this because uh, in your childhood a friend of yours died of a spider bite in Australia. Um, or uh, you've always had phobias. You used to be phobic of dogs, and now you're phobic of spiders. So that predisposes you to having a problems of spiders. And we might say, and things are perpetuated because you have a family that work and, and uh, you have good supportive relationships, so this doesn't cause enough problems for you to need to change. And you might be protected because you're well educated and you, you, you live in a family where uh, things are stopped from spiraling. Yes? That's how we construct the story. That's the shape of a story. Now, in psychiatry, um, we uh, like uh, uh, to, to classify factors uh, rather than to work out how one factor interacts with another because that makes the formulation closer to a diagnosis and the convention is to classify the factors of a formulation in columns according to those five categories of the story and then to further divide them into biological factors psychological factors and um, social factors um, uh, so for instance we would say the problem is a biological condition called phobia or we may say the problem is a psychological condition which is that you run away and we might say the predisposition is biological because you have a genetic predisposition or is psychological because you used to have phobias when you were uh, a, a child or is social because you had that story with somebody uh, in Australia and we might do this for all the little boxes in that chart and work out what is a predisposing factor what is um, precipitating factor, what is psychological, what is biological, and what is social. Uh, I find the idea of factors um, a bit confusing because uh, what we are doing really is attributing causality according to one of those five models. But when we present it like this, we pretend to be agnostic, but actually we are implying things. The second thing that I find difficult about this is that I don't know what is a psychological, a biological, and a social factor. Take, for instance, IQ. So uh, IQ, uh, uh, so intelligence, uh, is often a very important factor. Um, uh, how is a factor? It depends on the stories. But is IQ a biological construct? Well, IQ is highly genetic um, and, uh, and it's to do with an organization of your brain. But, but IQ is the epitome of a psychological concept. 
uh, and actually the value of IQ is completely socially determined and the effect IQ has on mental illness is depending on your environment so it is a social tool so I wouldn't know where to put IQ in the three roles and actually if you think hard about each of the factors it's very difficult to work out which one is biological which one is social I think the important thing to remember is that what is um, um, biological psychological or social is the attribution of whether that factor is causing the problem or not rather than the factor itself so um, I think that's as much as I want to explain on formulation. So we've got the, the five models that we use to make attributions um, and the shape of formulation. So how about diagnosis? Well, in psychiatry, we use diagnosis according to two books, uh, the ICD-10 soon to be 11 and the DSM-5 soon to be 6. And uh, diagnosis are the opposite of a narrative. They are categorical. So for instance, I'll give you an example of how those manuals diagnose depression. So in order to be depressed, you need to have um, uh, for a mild episode two of the main symptoms and two of the other symptoms or for a moderate episode two of the main symptoms plus three or four of the second ones and for a severe episode you need to have all three main symptoms plus four of the other symptoms and if you have those you tick the box you have a depression everybody is should be able to make that diagnosis if they know how to get that information uh, so it's not tailored to the patient this is tailored to everybody yes and that takes me to the differences between formulation and diagnosis so diagnoses are categorical you you put somebody in a category you have a phobia or a depression or an anxiety disorder and they're descriptive they said when i say you're depressed i see you meet those criteria i'm not saying why or um, um, i'm not saying what it means i'm just saying this is what describes what you've got and it's objective any psychiatrist following the same manual should arrive to the same uh, diagnosis it's not my opinion it's objective it's there anybody can observe this and tick those boxes and it doesn't attribute cause it doesn't say you're depressed because of that it said you are depressed that's all i'm saying yes and it's nomothetic it, it is uh, the same applied to everybody um, uh, it's a categorical thing you're making an assumption about what depression is not what's going on in the life of that person and it's fixed once you get a diagnosis you get a diagnosis you might stop having a diagnosis that doesn't mean that when you got it you got it yes whilst a formulation is the six things i said at the beginning it's a narrative it's a story and it's analytical we say there are three parts to this story and there are causal links and and separations and it's an opinion different people will have different uh, uh stories to tell depending on which models they prefer and they make causal attributions they said this is happening because of this yes um, and it's ideographic is tailored to that particular person is not making an assumption about everybody with the same problem and it's fluid so um, um, formulations change all the time people come to us with a formulation and we add information construct a more complex formulation and after they leave their formulation continues to change it's fluid it's not fixed and it's ideographic so l let me explain a little bit about the difference between ideographic and nomothetic you know so so ideographic means it's individual is subjective is private and um, and what you investigated is unique to that individual so formulations are unique whilst diagnoses are not there you establish principles this fits in the in the autism category in the depression category uh, and it's objective it's scientific demonstrable positivistic knowledge um, and you look for data which is objective like numbers and categories yes that's the two differences between uh, diagnosis and uh, formulation okay so um, uh, just a recap which is that uh, formulation is a story that makes sense of a behavior um, uh, I, we spend some time uh, looking at how to make sense uh, we had a, a little detour at the beginning to explain what the mind is and we said the 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 brain is to the mind what the eye is to vision and then we explain a little bit about the different functions of the mind and we hone in on one of them which is theory of mind which is the idea that 
or we have a mind function that allows us to understand other people's minds and that's the essence of formulation and once we establish those two key ideas uh, we talked about how we make sense of behavior and we came up with those five models you know the uh, psychodynamic model the behavioral model the cognitive model the biological model and the systemic model and once we discussed those we looked at uh, the nature of the story in formulations and we came up with this structure of the story of formulation which is that we establish what the problem is what predisposes what precipitates uh, what perpetuates and what protects and those are the key ideas of uh, formulation this is a story that helps helps make sense of behavior i hope you survive this 50 minutes of uh, of talking i just want to um, say um, uh, um, um, this is one of the most difficult most key ideas in psychiatry and also i want to say the story i said about my wife that that's not true my wife doesn't have spider phobia and i am really manly about the house so thank you very much and hopefully i'll see you another time